in which we will be discussing the meaning of Mariah Carey by Mariah Carey and Michaela Angela Davis. I'm speaking to you tonight from my office on the Vancouver campus of Simon Fraser University, located on unceded Coast Salish territory, and respectfully acknowledge the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Kutsi, Kwikwetlam, Kikite, Kwantlen, Semiyamu, and Tawasan peoples on whose traditional territories our university's three campuses reside. Uh, this land acknowledgement very much connects to the book we're discussing tonight, uh, The Intertwined History of Dispossession of Indigenous Peoples and Enslavement of Africans lies at the very heart of European colonization and settlement of the Western Hemisphere and form the crucible for the racial ideologies, power struggles, um, power structures, cultural expressions, and freedom struggles whose legacies we'll be discussing tonight through Mariah Carey's personal history. Before we begin our panel discussion, I'd like to recognize a few people uh, in my role as moderator tonight. I'm stepping into the big shoes of Roxanne Panchazzi. I, I actually don't know if her feet are big or not, but she conceived of this series uh, four years ago and did an outstanding job in hosting them for the last three years. Um, another colleague, Jeremy Brown, a Mariah Carey superfan, championed this book for this year's History Reads and has shown his commitment and lamely cred through a great deal of hard work in organizing this evening's panel. Um, and finally, Jonathan Gudlickson has done a fantastic job, as always, at communications, promotion, and making sure that this webinar ex experience is as good as it can be. And finally, I'd like to thank SFU's meetings and events and IT services for their role in supporting this event. Um, just before we begin, I'm going to make, I just want to let you know about the format of tonight's event, which is a Zoom webinar. In this format, audience, mem audience members can ask questions uh, via the Q&A function in your Zoom app. Uh, Jeremy and Jonathan will be moderating the Q&A and compiling your questions. And I'd ask you not to be shy with your questions and comments tonight. Um, despite the awkwardness of Zoom, uh, we hope to preserve the book club flavor as much as possible this evening. And you should also be bold because you're never going to get another opportunity like this one to discuss this book with such a perfect panel of experts. Uh, so let me introduce them so you can see what I mean by that. Uh, Michelle Sturgis is a PhD candidate and instructor in the Department of Communication at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, the title of her dissertation is The Political Aesthetics of Black Girl Magic, Self-Representation in Alternative Media, where she looks at representations of difference in comic books, artist books, and in the digital realm. You can find her writing in Race and Media, Critical Approaches from 2020, as well as the journals Lateral, Somatechnics, Art Practical, and New Archives. Angela Ards teaches African American and Contemporary American Literature at Morrissey College of Arts and Science uh, at Boston College in Massachusetts. She's the author of Words of Witness, Black Women's Autobiography in the Post-Brown Era, and her current book project uses oral histories to chronicle the lives of Black Americans who bypassed the Great Migration to remain in the South. She's the recipient of fellowships from Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study and the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research. Danny Alexander, our third panelist, served for over 30 years as associate editor for Dave Marsh's Rock and Rap Confidential, while also writing for, among others, Kansas City's Pitch and the Kansas City Star. Alexander teaches the literature of American popular music at Johnson Community College, a course he co-created with music journalist David Cantwell. His book, Real Love, No Drama, The Music of Mary J. Blige, was published by the University of Texas Press in 2016. And last but not least, my SFU colleague Jennifer Spear is a historian of race and gender in the settler colonial societies of what would become the United States, and she focuses on Louisiana. She's particularly interested in examining how laws about marriage and sexual relationships were used to embed race in the heart of slave societies in the Americas and how these laws were experienced in everyday lives. 
She's currently writing a biography of two sisters of mixed ancestry and their interracial families who experienced the Americanization of Louisiana in the aftermath of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, um, including the implications of the introduction of the one drop rule for the substantial population of free people of African descent who were recognized as a distinct legal and social category that challenged Anglo-American ideas that equated any degree of blackness with enslavement. So as you can see, each of these panelists are going to bring um, some really uh, important expertise uh, to, this, to this book um, uh, tonight. So to get the conversations going, um, I'm going to ask a kind of obvious uh, question, uh, which I'll ask all of you to address. A celebrity memoir by a pop diva superstar of the late 20th and 21st century is not the most obvious choice for a university history department's book club. Why should we take this book seriously as a historical document? What can it teach us? Um, and I think I'm going to start with Danny for this question. Well, thank you, Ken. Um, <clears throat> well, it, it's 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 a very it's a unique document in a whole lot of ways. Um, uh, the story of American culture, in in many ways, is the story of African American culture. Um, you know, you could argue that American culture. I think Eleanor Roosevelt used to say the only American cultures were the cultures of the First Nation peoples and 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 the and the African Americans, and and everything else was inherited from that, or or, or you know, stolen from that, or whatever you might say. Um, and what we have with Mariah Carey is we have the uh, top selling artist of, of one of the top selling artists of all time. She's like number 14. Um, the only woman that sold better than her in, in music history is Barbara Streisand. And um, she's the only person that comes close to bringing hip hop, one of the second major I mean, there's two great revolutionary um, movements. I mean, you could argue, argue jazz too, but that that sort of transformed world music out of the African diaspora into in America, and it went outwards the world. And and um, um, it, you know, we the first one we kind of tend to call the rock and roll big bang <laughs> happened in the when R and B um, was sort of embraced by everyone, and there was sort of a class perspective. That sort of, took over music and a teen culture that took over music in the, in the 1950s. Um, and then hip hop did the, did this again, like by deconstructing almost the rock and roll and soul universe that came before. Um, Mariah's book is, is written for a lot of the same reasons I wrote the book about Mary J. Blige. There was a movement when we still had a top 40 scene in, in essence, there was sort of a center to the culture I don't think it exists anymore. There was a, there was this, we, we have so many different, we, in the, we have so many multiverses of culture that we don't really have a sort of center the way we once did. I mean, Beyonce is a very important figure and various people are, Taylor Swift, whoever. But, um, but she wrote what I think of as the last major, especially in terms of social justice and, and even just transformative um, ideas about who we are, last sort of great mainstream movement in our culture, which was the, this movement of women onto the radio that started with black women. It really starts with a Janet Jackson album called Control there were, uh, in, the, in the mid eighties. And there's this whole flood of rap and R&B artists that come in the wake of that that are, that are taking control of their careers in a way that really didn't happen before, which then leads into a, a sort of a white women renaissance in the 90s <laughs> sort of follows on the heel of that as so often happens. Uh, and, and the reason I wanted to write about Mary J. Blige was because she was part of the same moment, um, which, which was, and, and was someone who had stayed the course for like 25 years for, you know, near, for, you know, the, all, we're working into the third decade. We're well into the third decade of these careers. And, um, so you see uh, an artist that recognizes the artistry of this movement that's gone worldwide. You see, and she speaks. One of my favorite things about this book is how often Mariah talks about the artistry of what she does. 
And so often people just focus, especially with women artists, they, do, they focus on their personal lives, anything but the artistry of what they're doing, um, how they look, whatever. <laughs> um, and uh, she, also, uh, she also recognizes in, in the significance of the moment that she was a part of and is a part of. It's not over. It's just transforming into different, a different era. Thank I you think very it's much. terribly important in the history of our art. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. Um, Angela, do you want to weigh in here? Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you again for having me on the panel. I, mean, I think there are so many reasons to read this, um, this memoir. I totally agree with Danny that um, one of the greatest revelations is the, is the artistry that we, you know, get from Mariah Carey. Um, the way the, the songs, um, lyrics of her songs are interspersed with the narrative itself, and we get to see how much autobiography and life writing is already embedded in the music. So we'll talk more about that, but I think that's actually really important. But I think, I think my m main point to this question would be that I don't think we often get books on Black women's lives that give us the, their interiority and their vulnerabilities. And there's something very political about having that representation out in the world. Um, Melissa Harris Perry, who's a political scientist and um, a well-known journalist, wrote a book a few years ago called Sister Citizen. And in it, she argues that um, the histories of slavery and segregation and racism and patriarchy have given us a sense of Black women's political agency in the stereo stereotype of the strong Black woman. That's how we expect Black women to move in the world. Um, and when we do that, uh, she argues as a political scientist, we as a society misrecognize Black women. We actually don't really see them for who they're for, for who they are, and that has personal and psychological consequences, but it most importantly has political consequences in terms of how we interact with Black women, how we incorporate them into our democracies, how we treat them as citizens. So um, I think it's super, super significant that Mariah Carey, along with Michaela Angela Davis, has written a book about trying to get free Right. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the black, the black autobiography tradition, but that whole tradition is about telling a free story uh, such that your free story could somehow get someone else in your community free. And I think in sharing this particular story about um, the little girl in her who finally gets a voice um, and how that takes her on a trajectory to superstardom is a story that we all can relate to in terms of um, being more authentic, authentic in our representation. But again, that has political significance in terms of how we recognize each other and treat each other as citizens. Yeah, I think uh, I really, I really appreciate that, that, that sense of vulnerability that she had, like, as you know, it's a, it's a wonderful depiction and uh, a very poignant depiction of her, of her, of her childhood. And uh, yeah, th thanks for that. Um, oh, and who was it that you just um, handed it over to? You're on mute. Karen. Sorry, you. Sorry, Michelle. Okay. Okay. I'm, uh, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, yeah. So I did, uh, uh, after reading it, I did some uh, YouTube research, so not, not <laughs> heavy. Um, and I found an interview with Trevor Noah from The Daily Show asking Mariah Carey why doing this, why did she decide to do this book now? And I think her response was something along the lines of like, why not? Um, and I think from what I got from the book was that she was setting the record straight in a lot of ways. And um, like Dr. Ars is just sharing, like revealing this interior uh, vulnerable self to, to the lambs and to anybody else that was willing to, to listen. And in a separate interview, uh, Michaela Angela Davis, uh, her response was that Mariah Carey is one of the greats. And a lot of her peers, other mus musicians like Prince, 
Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, um, they, we don't, they're not with us and we don't necessarily have those stories. And so there was a sense of urgency for her um, that I could really respect and appreciate. Um, for me, the, the book is about isolation and loneliness, uh, perseverance and difference. Um, and I think it is very relatable, uh, especially uh, right now with all of the isolation that we are all um, <laughs> engaging with in different ways. Um, and, and I think it still also holds true to all of her divaness. Like I loved all the darlings though. <laughs> yeah, um, it, was, it was great. Um, and uh, and I and I also remember her saying something, and I, uh, maybe I'm mixing it with an interviewer within the book, but she expressed that you know when she's ex experiencing stress, she likes to be festive, and and uh, I think what better way to to be festive during a troubling time than uh, releasing her book? Um, so personally, I uh, am a fan of Mariah Carey. Um, and I've uh, gone through many different Mariah Carey uh, listening phases, has an early 90s baby. Um, and I think I've taken her for granted And this book was an opportunity to really um, recognize and appreciate somebody who has um, really contributed a lot to my life, actually. Uh, even just fall quarter, listening to Mariah Carey, she was like top five for me fall quarter. So um, uh, the story is, it's full of voice and it's endearing and and quite honestly, uh, for spring break, it was a kind of a forced opportunity to reconnect with my love for reading, uh, which as a graduate student that's dissertating, you know, mm, <laughs> reading right now has not, not been my most favorite. And this um, really, really was, uh, was a nice opportunity for me. Um, and, and of course, I, I hope to offer some take on Mariah Carey um, as a representation of mixed race or multiracial blackness. Um, and I think just like her story, like all representations of uh, multiracial black folks um, in America, it does mean something. Um, and, you know, I think that our work is to figure out what exactly does it mean um, as, the, you know, as the title. Uh, uh, points to. Um, and especially in this post-45 moment, um, I think we see in, in reading this book, we see a Black woman who, despite um, all of her claim to fame and money, um, still struggles with finding safety. And really uh, what resonated for me was this sort of safety within her homes, mm -hmm. um, whether it's with um, Tommy Matola. Um, or what she refers to as the shack that she grew up in, which I'm kind of like, you know, but based off of her penthouse, is it, was it really fully a shack or like, was it something that, you know, I just, I got a little uncertain about how skewed things were by the socioeconomic status, but, um, you know, and then uh, even in the house that she bought for her mother, again, when the police showed up um, to, to, to take her away, um, she really was expressing, is expressing this, um, uh, kind of uh, desperation for, for a sense of safety. Um, and, you know, and I think, again, that's super important uh, right now um, uh, in the face of um, losing uh, amazing uh, Black women like Breonna Taylor, who are, are taken away from us uh, too soon in, in, in the middle of the night in their homes. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you know, I want to hold a critical uh, thumb to it and, and, and continue to think about the things that did shield her, that have shielded her, such that she could write this book, um, but, but at the same time, holding, holding on to that, uh, that expression. Um, and yeah, and I, I look forward to talking, talking more about the ways that race, gender, and sexuality uh, have played out in the, in the book for folks. No. Thanks. Thanks so much for that. I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I was just really thinking about this book in terms of something, a book that somebody would pick up uh, without, you know, without, without expecting this story. And, you know, the, the important, you know, the import, the importance of, of some of the stuff that you've just been talking about and how it's, how it's uh, revealed in in the genre, in this genre of celebrity memoir. So yeah, thanks a lot for that. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to finish us off with this question? Uh, sure, I'm, I'm glad to, to be going last here and uh, 
delighted to, to hear the insights of my uh, fellow panelists. I feel very much uh, out of my depth here. I was aware of Mariah Carey as a, as a musician and a singer, and uh, but did not know very much about her life um, at all, as I've never read a celebrity memoir before. Uh, and I'm a historian of the 18th century, which I feel is, is very, in some ways, incredibly far removed from, from her um, her life and her history, and, and yet in, in other ways, there are uh, elements that, that did really resonate with me and some of the issues that uh, Michelle was just talking about in terms of sort of the power dynamics and the, the vulnerability and the, the um, feeling unsafe at home. Um, I approached this question a, a little bit differently, which was um, as somebody who is trying to research uh, two sisters like, like Mariah Carey, uh, who lived um, you know, almost 300 years ago, um, what are the kinds of sources that we have? Um, for doing this kinds of research and, and how those sources really kind of um, influence the way we end up being able to get to tell these stories. So I, I have no document anywhere remotely uh, similar to this. Um, uh, there, there's one way in which uh, Louisiana and New Orleans in the 18th century is an incredibly rich um, collection of, of sources for uncovering everyday life. They were, it was a Catholic uh, colony. And so births and, and marriages and deaths were, were very well documented. And you can really reconstruct uh, families in a way that you often can't for, for other places in, in colonial North America. Um, uh, similarly, economic transactions were, were very recorded. So I do have wills. Um, for several of, of the family members um, that I'm writing about. But there's very little intimate source work in terms of letters, personal letters, or, or diaries, or, or memoirs like this. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we are getting one woman's perspective uh, on, on her experience as a mixed race woman um, and, and uh, living, coming from an interracial family. Um, and as a celebrity memoir, I mean, I think, I think I'd like to, you know, hear from some of the other family members uh, as, as, as well. Um, but I think it's, it's you know, it would, it's, it is for, for a historian of the future, um, there's a lot that can be unpacked about what it means to, to live this kind of race and gendered life um, in the 21st century. Thanks, thanks very much for that. That's, that was a great start uh, to, to the panel. Um, I'm going to I'm going to turn to uh, a round of questions that that are a little more specific to your areas of expertise and I'm going to start with Angela I I was wondering how this um, how this memory memoir fits into the history of African American uh, women's autobiography but maybe before you can you answer that you could also tell us a little bit about the importance of this genre uh, in telling uh, black women's stories uh, um, and uh, it, uh, the stories of black women in the United States. Um, in terms of the importance of the genre, um, you know, I often think about autobiography as a way for African Americans to create a self on the page. So when thinking about the beginning of the Black autobiography tr tradition in the US, I mean, that's the slave narratives. And these are people who are enslaved, who are deemed less than human. Um, and, and much of that assessment came through this idea of literacy, right? If you, if you can't read and you can't write, um, how can you express your humanity if you don't have a written language? So, so much of autobiography was about um, proving one's humanity, um, showing that, um, and how often, um, so many autobiographies were uh, used to actually, uh, well, I'm thinking about uh, Phyllis Wheatley, it's not her autobiography, but her first book of poetry, the first you know, Black woman published in America used those poems and, uh, to, get, to buy her freedom, right? So in thinking about, it, it's called the literacy as freedom trope, right? When you write yourself um, on, on the page, into existence, you push back against this idea that you um, are, are not human. So autobiography has always had a really political um, kind of role in the literary tradition. And then it also was a model, if you think of, you know, the classic autobiographies or slave narratives like Fred, Fred Douglas, Douglas's 1845 narrative or Harriet Jacobs's 
1861 narrative. I mean, they're showing people how they actually uh, achieved their physical freedom. They often ach achieved a spiritual or psychological freedom first, right? But this idea of how one gets free. Um, so I think it's actually significant that um, in Mariah's book, part four is called Emancipation, right? Where she is uh, bringing on this idea of of finding some sense of personal freedom uh, and modeling that, I think, for her readers about how they too can um, be vulnerable and true to their stories, right? Um, and how that can bring them a sense of a personal, psychological, and as I began this conversation, political freedom, right? When you put that authentic, real story out there. So that's why that's what I think of the significance of Black autobiography, the tradition that she's writing into. Um, and I saw a couple of things that really stood out to me. Um, I mean, the first thing I'd say is that when you think about the tradition of autobiography, in, beginning with the slave narrative, there are always these authenticating documents in them, right? There might be a bill of sale or a contract or, you know, showing, oh, th th this verifies a story that you told in this piece. Well, one of those authentic authenticating documents that you always have is a preface, right? And it's usually a preface written by some white person of high authority that will say, I can, bear, I, I can vouch for this person and I can tell you um, for a fact that they wrote this story, this is true. Uh, and because of this idea that, well, you know, Black people can't write, there's no way a Black person wrote this book, you need this preface for uh, someone to say, well, this is a true story. So, you know, for Fred, Frederick Douglass's 1845 narrative, that was William Lord Garrison, right? This is a true story. Um, what I think is really, well, uh, other thing I want to say, the person, that tradition started again with Phyllis Wheatley, with her... Um, her first collection of poetry, her only collection of poetry, um, 18 notables here in Boston, including John Hancock, basically tested her, right? They, they quizzed her on her poems to say, did she really write them? And then once she satisfied them, they wrote a document, a preface, the beginning of her poems to say, we can, we can assure you, we 18 notables of Boston can assure you that this was written by Phyllis Wheatley. So this idea of a, an authenticating preface goes way back. So I love the preface of um, Mariah Carey's book where first of all, she authenticates herself, right? She says, this is my book, I wrote it. And, and, and beyond authenticating herself, she, she has the nerve to define what truth is, right? She's like, I know there are gonna be other people out there who see this story a little differently than I do, but I actually wrote it. But she says, but these are the moments that most accurately tell the story of who I am according to me, right? So it's when we think about just the evolution of a preface in Black autobiography, this is actually very bold right, to authenticate yourself and to define truth for yourself. Um, the second thing that I just thought was really interesting, and it's kind of related to what I said before, in the history of Black women's autobiography, I mean, I think Black autobiography, period, but particularly Black women's autobiography, there have always been these strategic silences, right, around, um, things that have happened in their lives. So in the 19th century, it was usually very strategic silences around sexual abuse and rape endured during slavery. So I'm thinking of the narrative of Sojourner Truth in the 1850s. I mean, she, uh, she was like, for reasons of delicacy, we're not going to talk about these things. So what she suffered in slavery is completely erased from that narrative. Or if we think about Harriet Jacobs's incident in the life of a slave girl in 1861, she talks about what happens, but she makes it very clear that those stories are undertold, right? She's not telling everything. Um, and in the 20th century, there's Asada Shakur's narrative where she just doesn't tell us how she escaped from pr prison and got to Cuba. Like to this day, we don't know how that happened, right? So. In the 19th century, the reason for those strategic silences was, you know, the 19th century 
cult of true womanhood, right, of these values of propriety and piety, right? And so maybe a Sojourner Truth or a Harriet Jacobs didn't want to offend the Victorian sensibilities of their northern white women readers, right? So maybe they won't mention uh, the rapes they endure because they don't want to offend them. They also don't want to perpetuate stereotypes about Black women's promiscuity, right? So they are very circumspect about that part of their lives. In the 20th century, a historian named Darlene Clark Hines described the silence as the culture of dissemblance. She was like, you know, Black women protect their inner lives, mainly because they're misrecognized in society, right? And so they don't want to put, they're very protective, right? They, they want a sense of safety. They don't have safety out there, so they will create safety within their narratives. It was, it was Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, right, for the 1970s, where she reveals some of the childhood trauma that she experienced with sexual abuse that um, kind of really pushed against this culture of dissemblance, right, and encouraged Black women to be more forthcoming about what their inner lives are like. Um, and after that, we get tons of, lots of works. Right now, I think of uh, Elaine Brown's A Taste of Power. Um, but you see Black women talking about not just sexual abuse, but mental illness uh, or dysfunctional families, as we, you know, we see in Mariah's book, or um, parental neglect you know, that she experienced, uh, difficulties in her marriage, affairs that, that she's had. But these, this, this is a kind of a new trend, right? That, um, her, her text, The Meaning of Mariah Carey, kind of follows in the vein of um, Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. I could say some more, but I think I've talked a lot. I'll stop there. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much. And I, uh, yeah, there's, there was, that's great context too, and really fascinating. Uh, so thank, thanks very much for that. Um, uh, Danny, um, I was going to ask, follow up from what you were saying in your first, in your first comments there about the um about about her importance to them in in the music industry and one of the things that i really um that i really picked up on here was that you know she's really addressing this color line in the music industry uh, uh between historically black genres like hip-hop and, and well especially hip-hop um and and so-called mainstream white pop music and and her struggles with these music industry overlords the most prominent of which of course is her her husband tommy matola um and, um, and her struggle to openly embrace and to celebrate her blackness through her music but there's also this other part too where she's like talking about she's got uh, like her unerring ear and 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 her understanding that there are big shifts happening in the music industry, right? That, um, and that um, she's sort of um, um, at this cusp, like you say, of, of a kind of, um, uh, you know, of the, the, the dominance of these genres uh, in, in American music, and also a kind of push for self-determination by Black artists uh, in this period. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little more about this, these seismic shifts that were happening and how her story uh, kind of represents both her personal story and then, well, you know, her, her personal struggle with the music industry, but then also, you know, the fact that she's kind of, um, she sees what's coming. Uh, and uh, maybe just to talk a little bit about that. Thanks. Uh, um, well, it's 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 a it's a big and wonderful question because I started writing about music. I'm 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 actually a fan um, who wrote about music. Uh, uh, you know, a, kind of a commercial writer, really. Even though I teach and you know I work in academics, but I I, I wrote about this as it was happening, and and I. This anecdotally, it's just it. You know, there was I. There used to be promo bins. You go into like where wherever you wrote, and there would be this bin where like people fought over whatever new music was coming out, right? And and what was left over in the promo bin in the late '80s was almost invariably uh, a few genres, but especially women 
um, women artists, black women artists who are making this incredibly compelling music. And, um, and so I sort of early on, well, there were a couple of things. I've been married a few years and I found that black women in particular, women in general, but black women in particular spoke to the vagaries of like trying to maintain relationships <laughs> and like what life is, 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 you know, and, and there was, there was this whole dialogue that was going on between hip hop and R and B and within hip hop. Um, between uh, what the men were saying and what the women were saying. There was all this call and response going back and forth. And, and it was a very vital dialogue um, that was really unlike anything I'd ever seen before. And I was a huge, you know, rock music fan. But there's this, this sort of impulse over and over again through the history of, as I said, I think all of our music really starts with this, this blending, this mixing of the races. And it starts off in a really sort of ugly way with minstrelsy, but it keeps getting sort of, that's 80 years of our history, but it keeps getting sort of subverted because the music actually, there's, there's, a, there's a great book about that called Love and Theft, but, but the, there's an attraction, there's something that people are after there um, that, that isn't in, white culture is almost really, by, it, it means absence of culture. <laughs> like there's no particular culture. It's just whatever is not defined. And, 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 um, and you get in that you get a very self aware in the sort of in the resegregation of music that starts happening. It happens first in the 70s, 60s and 70s, when you get rock, as opposed to rock and roll, and then soul, you get kind of a resegregation of that exciting sort of coming together that happened in the 50s and early 60s. And in hip hop, you have a very self-conscious, self-aware, and, and since I'm talking to academics, I can probably say a deconstruction of the culture with turntables and Jamaican sound systems and things. People are like taking apart the culture and remaking it with hip hop. And, um, and in, the mix, in the mix there, women were, were such an important part of it, even if just like in the civil rights movement, <laughs> You might not know there. You might not know Ella Baker's story as well as you know, like Martin Luther King's story or something. But they were they were crucial to everything that was actually happening. And so um, there's this wave that she can't miss. I mean, she's she's a part of it. Um, she's uh, she, you know it, people think she's white and they sort of love that she's pretty and that her music is. Uh, has a, there's a cuteness to it or whatever, and she keeps sort of getting sort of spun a certain way, but she keeps resisting because she knows what the movement is at that time. And the movement is, as she says in the book, the movement is not to make guys like Tommy Mottola feel cool. It's not about that. It's about, um, it's about in a way, turning, uh, you know, when you put these things together, and, and Angela said a, a, a number of times that this is political, you know, th this is profoundly political in this sort of um, uh, white, male-dominated, capitalist, um, individualist culture. When you have women and music, and you invariably have community as the subject matter and relations as the subject matter, and, and something Angela said that really speaks to me is something I started hearing very, very early on is just how significant, like a black woman's voice said something that nobody else was saying. I mean, women's voices in general, but a black woman's voice said something that nobody else was saying, no matter what was being said almost. And it was very important um, to changing, to revitalize in the music at that point, really, and to, and to challenging the status quo and to challenging the titans of industry like her husband, <laughs> she uh, gets sort of trapped in Sing Sing with, right? Uh, by the way, I love that. I mean, talk about the politics and being self-aware of the politics. She takes a paragraph there to describe the parallels between her mansion and Sing Sing prison. That is just, and, and just the nature of prison, I mean, that may be overstating the drama of her situation a little bit, but, 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 but she, the description of prison is dead on, right? It's what it does to people and what it is. And um, so, so 
you know, one thing I like to point out is in about 1995, at the peak of her, her early career, um, there's a movie made about the Black Panthers um, directed by Mario Van Peebles. And it had a hit song written by a woman named Joy um, called, called, well, a huge hit, but Freedom. 60 different R&B and, and rap artists were on that record, uh, all women. And you could watch that at that moment. And most of us who were into the music could name everybody in all that, those aisles of the 60 women that were there. That's not a phenomenon that if you're a, 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 an African-American woman making music in the late 80s, early 90s, that you're not aware of, right? I mean, it's a very important phenomenon. And, and I think it was like, again, I can't help but reiterate, going back to, you know, you know we go back to the earliest hit selling records, we have the blues women. We have people like Bessie Smith selling 2 million copies of a record. Um, um, but women have always been sort of written out of the history. And I think hip hop was a, very aware of um, the, the potential for women to write themselves into the history and make sure they were in the history, you know, to answer the men. All the answer records, just answering back, you know. And then, of course, the records where you put hip hop and R&B together and you, and, you, and you have this sort of dialogue between the genres. So I don't know if I'm overstating, if I'm going on too long, but I... I there's so much I want to say about this. Yeah, I know, I know. It's, it's. I'm, I'm realizing that <laughs> there's, there's a wealth to be spoken about here. But I am going to move on so that we yeah. have lots of time for questions after, after this from the audience. Um, Michelle, um, at the heart of this memoir, as I read it, is a very personal testimony of the trauma Carrie experienced as a mixed race woman in the United States, and, and specifically you know, in the urban and suburban uh, uh, n uh, north of the United States, which I think for a lot of Canadians in the audience, that might be, they might be surprised by that, the, 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 the kind of the segregation in those, those communities and the racism there too. Um, so, so it's a chronicle of the pain caused for her and her family by the black, white color line in the U.S., uh, but also at the same time, it's this sort of triumphant and spectacular story of transcendence uh, of that barrier and claiming of her mixed uh, racial identity and especially her blackness. So what can this story tell us uh, about the experience of mixed race people of African and European ancestry in the U.S., both past and present? Thank you for that question. And um, I, yeah, I really appreciate the way you set it up. I, I want to respond because I don't think that I have a complete answer to the question. And I think that's, that's part of it is um, that uh, her story is really asking us to hold some of the tensions that she's, she's had to hold in her, in her own lived experience. Um, and so actually what you had just said, there was a quote that I wanted to share, and it comes from towards the end of the book, um, where she says, the past and the present felt the same, unsafe. Um, and so I think that, uh, yeah, we, we typically will see um, multiracial Black figures uh, represented um, across a spectrum, but uh, stereotypes. So there is still stereotyping that happens. And um, the, 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 the old version is the uh, tragic mulatta stereotype where um, you're, she's literally torn in two and um, just a complete uh, tragedy. Um, and then it's, it's so funny, uh, maybe it's a funny, but um, my Black sorority sister, she told me, <laughs> she said um, one time she told me I was a tragic mulatta. And, she's, and I said, what do you mean? And she said, you know, like Mariah Carey. And I feel like in some way there was, uh, um, I, I, I kind of understood what she meant when she said it. And obviously her telling me that is like problematic in and of itself. But I think that what, what stands out is that, that she, she drew on Mariah Carey as this sort of image for her. And I couldn't help but notice that there, there was a, a um, through explaining the traumas that, that she's been through, um, whether it was like in her adult life or in her childhood, that there were these moments um, of tragedy. And, and one uh, uh, moment that stuck out to me as well is when she said that um, her sadness, or uh, someone had explained to her that sadness was really um, anger internalized. 
Um, and I think there we find her caught in yet another bind um, that's another stereotype that's thrown at Black women, which is the angry Black woman stereotype, right? And so she's kind of bouncing around from, from one stereotype to the other, trying to find a way to, to be free of that, really. Um, and, and I think that there's, there's this um, tension still that's left. So even though towards the end of the book, we have the section titled Emancipation, and she kind of says, I am complete um, in reflection on her family that she started. Um, you know, I, I know through my research, um, Dr. Relina Joseph has written about this, that the tragic mulatta has changed over time into um, a new millennium mulatta, and then you have the exceptional multiracial, and you can kind of see that depicted in um, Barack Obama, our president, or our past president, right? I still think he's our president, no, um, but Barack Obama, right? Like, he's um, exceptional, he's managed to transcend. Um, but I think really the strong undercurrent that I pulled out earlier of this um, not feeling feeling safe. So even if there's this um, idealizing a sort of completeness that I would argue was was always there from the beginning, anyways. Um, there's, uh, there's still this kind of tension between multiple stereotypes that's happening. Uh, and for me as a, as a writer, that is so frustrating because it's like either let's make it a horror story or let's make it a romance. You know, let's like get somewhere, some sort of relief, that some sort of actual answer. And um, in, in some of my other work, uh, looking at mixed race representations, it's really a struggle for us to just sit and hold all that tension. And I think the scene, again, where she kind of has her breakdown moment is, um, so, so when you're saying, what can it tell us? I think it doesn't necessarily tell us, but it is showing us what it, what it looks like and feels like to embody that tension. And, and what happens if there isn't, um, an opportunity to, to release, which I think is why I enjoyed uh, reading the book so much. It was an opportunity for me to release in my life. And it's, I think, why we're drawn to so much of the media that we all consume, um, because it gives us these valves or these outlets um, that allow us to kind of escape from, from the embodied tension that I think we all hold in various various ways um, as, as a, but yeah, you know, so I think, I think that's kind of the, you know, so for me, I was trying to focus a lot on, on her body um, and descriptions of her body. And I think oftentimes it would, it would kind of quickly veer into um, her voice and then all of the wonderful technicalities of, of music making. Um, sometimes she would give us really rich details of her fashion choices, which I like loved that she just could like pick out different outfits and explain it like to a T um, what she was wearing and why she chose to wear that. Um, and again, there was a presence of humor, but I think um, kind of made me think about Dr. Arts, how, how you're talking about dissemblance and this politics of silence. And I, and I still, I think um, it may not be like an intentional choice to withhold certain things, but I think that there are moments where her body is becoming this way to kind of articulate something that really our language struggles to capture, which is this this tension, because I think as we begin to name something, we're already starting to slide it into one category or the other, um, and then it just, you know, so, so yeah, so that's where, that's, that's, does that, I feel like, is that, does that answer? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great, and I think, uh, yeah, I think that, that, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed your answer there, um, and the new, the nuance, and the, and that, that notion of, of holding the tension uh, of, of her, of her experience, and what that, you know, in the, her personal story, how that, that, um, uh, how, how, how important that is, and sort of understanding um, some of the issues facing mixed race people in the United States. Um, is that, is, yeah. So, okay, so Jennifer, um, could I move on to you here and ask um, uh, if you could sort of think, reflect on what we've heard so far, and um, if there's, if you could put Carrie's experience into some deeper historical context uh, for us, you know, what are some of the social, political, legal origins of Carrie's experience as a mixed race woman? Okay, thank you, Karen. Um, her, her experience, I think, both shows uh, 
something that, that is often seen as exceptional um, in US history, um, as somebody who does uh, embrace that, that I think at one point she refers to it as the mixedness, um, mixedishness of, of her life. Um, for for uh, 350 years, uh, Anglo-Americans at least, those in power and those who were writing the laws, did their very best to, to deny the existence of people like, like Mariah and, and many others. Um, they tried to establish a color line that, that she refers to right, as, as the one drop rule, which is a, it's a long, slow process that, that develops the color, the, the one drop rule. Um, but certainly by the, the mid to late 19th century um, in most of the uh, United States, uh, there was this equation of, of any identifiable African ancestry um, with enslavement and blackness. Um, that there, there wasn't a recognition of, of in-between um, categories. Um, the sort of, uh, terms that imply mixed ancestry certainly existed in colonial records and in, in 19th century records. Uh, 19th century censuses occasionally uh, included a category uh, labeled mulatto. Um, and in, in uh, colonial records and, and also 19th century uh, records, um, mixed race terms were used as kind of descriptive labels for in, in things like runaway ads or, or slave sales. Um, but as a kind of legal category, as, as um, one that was seen distinct from a, an overarching, and um, to use the language of the time in, in Anglo-American colonies, Negro was kind of the overarching category defining blackness and, and enslavement. Um, and so you know, people of, of mixed race were kind of lumped under that and, and rarely kind of recognized as, as significant and, and different. Um, one of the ways that we see these kinds of equations being made in, in the Anglo-American colonies um, is that some of the very earliest laws that are trying to define blackness and to, to link it um, with slavery um, are, particular, are around the regulation of sex. Um, and so bans on, on interracial marriages, bans on, on extramarital sex between people of European descent and African descent are often the, the very first places that you see um, these equations being made. Um, but these bans were, were never never uh, fully successful, uh, mostly because of, of incredibly violent and coercive sex that, that white men uh, imposed upon um, uh, women, enslaved women of color that, that um, although on the one hand can be seen as blurring that equation between blackness and slavery and whiteness and freedom, um, actually serve to reinforce, right, the violence of this sexualized, uh, gendered and, and racialized hierarchies. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, there were mixed race people that were born, but as I said, in the kind of the Anglo-American colonies, they were generally lumped under these, these categories of, of black. Um, but this doesn't, this isn't the way that all racialized uh, systems uh, developed uh, in, in the slave systems in the Americas. Um, and one of the reasons that uh, uh, I find working on, on Louisiana so interesting is that because it was first colonized by the French and then the Spanish before the Americans came in, in 1803, you actually have these layers of different racial formations um, from these different uh, colonial empires. And so by the time Louisiana did become part of the United States, um, there was a very significant um, population, not only of, of people who were identified and seen as mixed race and, and named as such, um, but also uh, a significant population of free people of African descent. And there's a lot of overlap uh, between those for, for some complicated reasons. Um, the, the population of free people of color in New Orleans was 20% um, in the early uh, 1800s hundreds when, when it became part of the United States. In comparison, Charleston um, was the other Anglo-American city that had the, the largest population of free people of color and it was only 5%. Um, so New Orleans really did, Louisiana really did present this different racial system, which had a very clear legal and social category of, of free people of color. Um, uh, and and uh, did did link that with mixedness. So if, if the um, Anglo-American system was equating blackness and slavery and whiteness and freedom with no space for people in between, either by status or, or by um, mixed ancestry, New Orleans did recognize this, this um, intermediate uh, category. Um, and we get, we actually get a hint of this in, in uh, the, the memoir, um, when Mariah Carey talked with, about this different ways of thinking about race and, and blackness. Um, when, when she talks about the ending of her relationship with Luis Miguel, um, this is in the, the chapter, I think, uh, titled the, the Latin Elvis, um, where they have, the, she says one of the sort of the major reason that they ended their relationship after three years was a cultural clash around race um, in which she kept asserting her blackness. Um, and he kept saying, no, your father is black, but you're not black. 
um, and that that much more sort of uh, Spanish American way of, of recognizing that there's there was a distinction um, between um, uh, uh, between you, you could see somebody of African ancestry, but not not call them black, um, and that there were other labels um, uh, to, to refer to those people. So um, I found that one of those moments where I could really recognize uh, some, of, some of the history that I studied. So. Great. Well, thanks for everybody for answering my questions there. And um, I think what we're going to do now is open it up to the audience. Um, and uh, my colleague, Jennifer, uh, Jeremy Brown, is going to, um, he's going to, uh, yeah, he's going to get us started, I think. Thanks so much, Karen. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I really appreciate your comments. And we are extremely fortunate to have in our audience the author of this book, Michaela Angela Davis. So if technology allows, and if you are willing, Michaela Angela, I was wondering if you might like to ask a question, respond, react, and kick off our Q&A portion with your reaction to the book, if you're willing and if the technology works. All right, we see you. So if you unmute, we'd love to hear uh, your reaction or, or your response. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> so I am so um, surprised how moved I am. Um, and I think I wrote that in the chat. Thank you, uh, Professor Brown, for tweeting and, you know, and bringing this to my attention because, <clears throat> oh, I have so many thoughts. Um, but why I'm moved is that from the very beginning, Mariah and I were woefully underestimated by everyone, by the publishers, by the literary. I mean, I literally had an um, an early editor when I turned in our first chapter, run towards me and go, "Oh my God, we didn't know it was going to be so literary." I mean, I, I mean, never approached this. Yeah, it was almost like I, I, I you know, and there was a part of me. You know, there's layers when you when someone says that to you. But there's a part of me that really understood this because it's Mariah Carey and I and I was very aware of the how she was being held in the cultural um, imagination, right? Particularly people who weren't um, black, right? And then too, like it's complicated. She's complicated, and that's what made her such a compelling American um, figure. And so, because we were so underestimated um, by everyone, and we never saw this as a celebrity memoir, we were calling it a memoir of an identity, because we also had to really have a lens in which we were going to tell the story, because there were so many places to go with it. Um, it could have been very splashy and all of that, but, we, but um, I think it was Angela, you kept talking about this freedom this was a freedom story she she had an album called the emancipation of of mimi she said it like i'm emancipating myself and her when i asked her why do you want to write this book she said to emancipate that little girl in me and i'm like i'm in um and angela you said something else this notion of um um authentic authentic authenticating documents we and the preface that she authenticated herself, I was like, yes, I was over yes. But um, what we did was use her lyrics to authenticate her stories. Because also that's something that so many people did not, they just don't recognize the songwriting that she's done. That is, I mean, I, for Christmas, I gave her this handmade leather bound book of her lyrics and it looked like a Bible. The songs that she has written the stories that she has told. And um, because she can sing and she's got curly hair and big boobs, like that's been, like it's been a, this erasure of her songwriting, producing her agency. So this book was really also to um, be clear uh, that she has written her life and story through her lyrics. And that's how I approached it from the beginning. My, my process was first to really look at her lyrics away from like not listening to the music, not listening to the 
beat and just she has been telling us her story the whole time about being ambiguous about being on the outside and um something that was very important and and then the way that the issues of the world were coming in at the same time you know um her experiences with the police her and i think karen you were saying about uh, the racism in North America, in the northern part of the United States. The, what was also very important to her is to tell these stories of the cruelty from white folks through the eyes of a, a mixed black girl. Like she identifies as a mixed black girl. And, you know, being kidnapped and cornered and called the N word and, you know, the, this cruelty. And she was, what because what she was saying is like, I know who the MAGA folks are. I grew up with them. I know them. And I want and because she's such a beloved global figure, she figured if she could tell through her personal stories, maybe other folks would understand as well. So she she's very conscious of her global appeal and having that global appeal to be able to talk about race and race in America in this very complicated way. And also she, for the record, <laughs> she's the biggest selling female artist of all time. So that's a solo artist. So that's even above Babs, she's holding that record. So just let's be clear on that one. But um, but thank you, this is, because this was a job. I've always critiqued how, why doesn't the Academy acknowledge I care. I've been to Beyonce symposiums, Rihanna symposiums, like Nas is, you know, archives at Yale or something. Like, and and the hip hop community has not acknowledged her. She's done practically what Diddy did, meaning bringing all these genres together, getting Jay Z in top forty for the first time. I mean, there's not one hip hop artist of that era, Bone Thugs, Cameron, Nicki Minaj, first time is on her like she brought so many people into mainstream. So, so this is very healing for me because I I really didn't, you know, believe that she was taken seriously as an artist because there was so much interest in her drama and so little interest in her con her cultural contribution. And, you know, I think Michelle, you would, I think it was you that had said something about her colleagues meaning Prince, Michael Jackson, Whitney, those were, that's pretty much her crew. Um, and that they didn't live to tell their story. And Prince was preparing his memoir. And so she felt certainly that urgency and that responsibility that someone that was having that kind of experience of global superstardom, um, having this racial ambiguity, like she and Prince uh, spent a lot of time talking about this and having agency and power and the sort of plantation organization of the music industry. And so, and there, so, and there's even more of that story. Like she didn't really talk that much about, um, and a lot of it's for legal reasons, like what she experienced inside the industry as a woman and a, a woman of color and a woman of color that writes and produces. So, um, but thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Brown. Thank you for all of you for taking this book seriously, for taking her story seriously. Um, and, and I have all these notes um, from your very rich conversation. So thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, it's your, uh, your artistry uh, combined with Mariah Carey's artistry, you make the book what it is. And, uh, and it, it should be appreciated for, for the serious book that it is. And actually I wanna, ask a question. We have a question submitted by an audience member named Leonor, who says, thank you for choosing this book and creating awareness for Mariah's incredible story. I'm joining from South Africa. And her question is about this question of underappreciation. Uh, and so Leonor asks, it has always boggled my mind how successful Mariah has been, yet regardless of her success, she is still very much underrated and underappreciated as a true artist in terms of her songwriting and production abilities. To what level does her physical appearance contribute to that, is Leonore's question. So maybe the panel could re respond to Michaela Angela's uh, 
powerful remarks and answer Leonora's question of uh, some people see, she says, some people see Mariah as ethnically ambiguous and how can such unconscious bias in music be eradicated in the future is the way that Leonora finishes her question there. Michelle, do you want to get us started on this? Okay, well, I, again, I don't know if I have a complete answer for you, but I, I, when I was writing some of my own notes, I was thinking about, the question came up for me, and, I, and it was more like a, trying to anticipate a question that we might get, and, and I think it was something, I kind of wrote it along the lines of, what's the weight of her lightness? How does her light skin play into um, uh, her story? And, and like, how has it, how might folks want to attribute how, and I think this, so, so here's how I responded to that, like, or in my mind, and now I'm responding out loud to you all, but it's, 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 it's um, the, if we think about what's the weight of her lightness that, or that makes her more appealing, um, that maybe shields her in particular ways, uh, I think that we have to be careful with that question. Um, I think because it's driving us towards some sort of concrete answer, it's, it's really kind of trying to measure something out that I think, again, the, the, the um, wealth of her story is that it kind of holds attention and doesn't actually um, met out. Here's where my light skin privilege completely helped me. Here's where it didn't matter that my skin, and, and I, I think we can find moments of that in, in the story, but I'm not, I'm not too sure um, what exactly we do with it then. Um, and, and ha yeah, so that's a, if, it's, if the question is, what's the weight of her lightness um, in her story of transcendence? I, my question back is why, why, why measure? Because I think that that plays into a history as well of trying to to quantify um, someone's blackness to some degree as as a way to bring them in or or um, push them out. So, thanks, Angela. Do you want to respond? Um, I guess the only thing I would add, and I agree with all of that, um, but if we also just think about the lightness in terms of her ethnicity her ethnicity, but also her femininity, right? So um, I think Michaela was talking about like her curviness and her curly hair. Uh, I, I think in the industry, and I'm not a, you know, a music scholar, but it seems to me that in the music industry, women in general are often disregarded in terms of their artistry and their, their songwriting abilities. So how much of her just kind of feminist, right? That femininity that's out there is also a part of the ways in which she has been um, under underestimated, right? And, and disregarded. Sorry. Um, Danny, do you want to weigh in here? Well, I just had a couple of thoughts because I, you know, in terms of Nelson, I remember, I distinctly remember Nelson George, who I admire a great deal, but I remember him, him dismissing her or, or saying something about her, this white girl, <laughs> when she first came out. And she pushed back in the media, which was great that she did that. Um, but yeah, I think those two things certainly, you know, have, 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 uh, have played into the way it's interesting. It's interesting the way, and she talks about the critics, and I'm one of them, but she talks about the critics um, in terms of them not really having that big of an impact when you get right down to it. And, and um, um, you know, the critics keep putting her in these boxes, but she keeps breaking out of them. And um, uh, so, but yeah, femininity, um, uh, being the white girl or the light skinned girl or whatever, you know, all of those things have played into this. I know, you know, with Mary J. Blige, she got taken most seriously when she made a video with Method Man and this sort of got her embraced, you know, in a, in a way. Um, uh, I absolutely love that, that, uh, that Mariah Carey does all that stuff, talks about the backing vocals and how much she appreciates the backing vocalists. And, that immediately brings to mind, you know, Mary, Mary's first sort of appearances as a backing vocalist for Father MC, which she talks, talks, speaks to. But anyway, um, I, I just, I think, you know, this goes back to the whole Trevor Noah question, but 
why now? Because no one has, and she needs to, and she's doing it. You know, she's speaking of this, and I think it's terribly important. And thank you so much for working with her on this book. I think that's so important. So, yes. Okay, Jeremy, do we have another question? We have uh, a series of questions and reactions about um, genre and audiobook in particular. Dan Saunders asks, do you feel that the audiobook almost tells a more complete version of Mariah's story with her song interludes, picking out bits and pieces of her songwriting and hearing her express her emotions through her voice? Uh, and then Sarah O, oh, along similar lines, but with a, a, an interesting detail says, in the, this discussion of written slave narratives, I'm also thinking about the oral WPA slave narratives and how an audiobook might fit into that. And uh, finally, Sarah Walshaw, our colleague at, here in the history department who works on African history, uh, writes that she enjoyed listening to this as a self-narrated audiobook. It got Sarah thinking about how technological changes and social media have changed Mariah Carey's relationship to the media and to her fans. She used her music to tell her story at a time when the media and her record label kept her relatively silenced. And so Sarah's interested to hear what discussions think about memoir genre in the TikTok, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter era. And so we can maybe think about this question of, of audiobook and, and genre. Does anybody want to get started with that question? I'll just, I, I would just brief. Oh, Angela's talking. What, I feel like I see Michaela's hand up. Do you want to hop in here, Michaela? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say very quickly, um, on the last issue, let's not forget the patriarchy. There was a very concerted effort to keep women um, in a certain way and design them in a certain way and never promote that they're a singer-songwriter because then you're like Carol King or whatever, like you're not sexy. So there's patriarchy is on top of all of this in terms of framing who she was. But it, so there was that. But uh, it, very interesting to get the audible question because she, she so enjoyed the process and it was very intimate. It was Mariah, her engineer, and me, and that's it. And when she recorded her vocals, the, the very private singing, she was by herself in her vocal booth. So, and it was very creatively stimulating for her to do the audible, like the, the book was emancipating. Like it was, there was a, a weight, like a, a clear freeing again. So thank you, Angela, for keep calling it that, a freedom story. But the audible process creatively, um, she was, it was so satisfying for her creatively. So I just want to give that context so the questions around Audible are great and she'll be really happy to know that people really are experiencing it in yeah, a particular I'm, way. I'm so sorry that that's not how I read the book <laughs> now. It sounds like people have had amazing experiences uh, with with the ebook and the and the audiobook. Um, and I, you know, I was in the old print <laughs> here. Go ahead, Angela, and then at Danny. I mean, I guess the only thing I would say, and it's not really a new point, um, because Michaela mentioned it before in terms of how Mariah has been telling us her story all along, right? So how much autobiography, life writing is already embedded in those lyrics. And I did it, and I was struck by that when I read it, right? I was struck by um, the way Michaela so expertly, you know, wove those lyrics into the chapters, made that really clear, that really evident. I didn't listen to the book, so I don't um, I don't have that experience. But I can imagine just the ad how the added sound of her voice, of hearing those songs, even if she's singing by herself, but hearing them in this new context, um, makes it so clear that even the songs are in their ways like a, an oral narrative that she has been given us. So I mean, I'm just kind of commenting on what people have said, but that definitely struck me uh, as I was reading. Yeah, I can, to I can totally agree with you uh, there. I mean, I, 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 it would have come alive for me in a totally different way if I had, and I'm, maybe I'll listen to it again. I'll listen. Danny, go ahead. 
Oh, I just, I think it works beautifully both ways. And, and it's interesting. One of the questions, I mean, one of the questions I was presented with real early on when I was writing about it is who is your audience? And, and, you know, she manages to speak to, to her full audience in various ways by having both versions. And, and, and it's a very hip hop book as an audio book because she mixes in all these, like there's ODB, like yeah, <laughs> there's all these different samples and, and, and the different like features from, from her records that instead that she puts right in there. And it's sort of wonderful to hear her do that. Does anyone else want to weigh in here? Okay, may, maybe is there another question, Jeremy? Well, speaking of ODB, I mean, we have some questions about that. And, and you'll notice if you, if you joined us right on time at the start, we started with Fantasy Remix with ODB at the very beginning. And this was what first came to mind to Michelle uh, when we thought, well, what do we start with? And it's such a pivotal moment in the book. Um, and so we have two questions who, who recognize that. Dan S writes, the addition of ODB to fantasy was considered a turning point of Mariah's musical evolution. But similar influences were apparent years earlier from day one, even if not fully supported by her record label. Do you think this book addresses how she took back her own narrative from her label about the type of artist she wanted to be? And Justin Lamb asks another question about Mariah's fantasy remix with ODB is one of the pioneering works that moved hip hop into the mainstream to an unprecedented level. And yet Mariah isn't always given her due in the same way that other male unambiguously black artists are. To what extent and how do you reconcile the privilege her racial ambiguity gave her to push a new generation of black music into the mainstream and the society's or industry's unwillingness to credit her as a woman for her contributions? Go ahead, Danny. Well, I have a partial answer to that. One thing, first of all, I, I don't know if I mentioned this yet, but I'm really glad to know that Barbara Streisand has now sold Mariah Carey. And what, what that really means is the woman that is the best selling artist of all time is of the hip hop generation, right? And she's also the best selling hip hop artist then in essence, because I don't think you don't have a voice like Mariah Carey's without hip hop. Um, so, um, I, I don't know about the privileging, but I think she took advantage of what she was able to do. And I think that's the best of what all of this can do, is to make the most of the conditions we're dealing with at any given moment. So. Anyone else? That's, that's really interesting. The tension between light skin privilege or, think, or proximity to whiteness as a privilege, but then the the the, the patriarchy, the the not having privilege because you were a woman, and the tensions being held between those. I mean, clearly we talk about that, but as it relates to that song in particular, and 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 also as a writer, that was the hardest scene for me to to write because it was so that when when she hears the um when she hears um ODB's sample for the first time because when she when she would call the story orally it was hysterical like we were on the floor laughing because Tommy was like the fuck is that I, I could do that like he just did not get it at all and Mariah is such a good actress and she has everybody's voices down so when she goes from ODB to Tommy and his and the clear rift where he just did not understand what was happening in the music industry. And Danny was talking about that. And how the record company thought she was nuts for this remix. But what MC did, what Mariah did almost every record, she made four versions. She made one for the club, for the you know queer kids. She made one for the urban station. She made one for the top 40. She understood that she had to like manipulate and shapeshift for all these different audiences and you know that it's you know it's documented in the book how they thought she had lost her mind with ODB and now it's one of the most endearing you know records and remixes 
for all of us. So, but it was really hard to write because it was so funny, but also so clear that she, when she and Tommy really made a departure culturally and musically, where like she, she had surpassed him. We have a critical question in the in the Q and A that I wanted to to raise uh, and 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 explore. And this is from Susan Nance, who asks: To what degree should we take Carrie's memoir as a personal memoir, grounded in a desire to set the record straight for her own peace of mind and legacy, versus as a marketing tool for her brand? In parentheses, yes, I realize I'm presenting a false dichotomy here. Who wants to take this one? Well, I, I don't understand what that means, the brand, when you're an artist. I don't, I don't understand that question. I guess I, I would uh, uh, take the question to be, I mean, all sources as historians, we have to, to treat them critically, but I didn't understand why they're being written and, and for what purpose. And, and this conversation has been great for understanding sort of the, the goals that, that she had in, in writing this book. and. Um, I agree that it, it is a false dichotomy, but uh, uh, and and they could be you know books can be written for multiple purposes, and of course authors can't control the, the audience reader reaction to them. You know, so all of those have to be dealt with. Yeah, just echoing off of that, it, it the question just makes me think about um, how does how does blackness circulate, and how do representations of um, of blackness circulate and, and what happens when various people take it up and decode it in ways that benefit them. Um, not, not that, uh, not, and I'm talking about like viewers or readers or uh, listeners, how, what they do with her story, um, which is something that I was kind of curious about with the, um, the, what was the literacy as freedom trope? Um, and I, and it really is just like a genuine question for me. So I don't know if I get to do that, if I can ask a question, even though we're supposed to be answering them. But um, uh, uh, C. Riley Snorton um, in a book, Black on Both Sides, has written about um, autobiography in there. And, and I, I, he, um, so he's telling a, 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 a racial history of trans. That's the the part after the semicolon black on both sides. And um, what I found really interesting in, uh, and I was hoping we might be able to get to talk about, is alongside this, um, this uh, literacy as freedom trope, um, the way that Snorton talks about autobiography and many of the same um, uh, narratives that you mentioned, Dr. Arts, uh, he refers to it as um, our top biography in, in that while the person is um, expressing the freedom that they've um, acquired, and I think this gets at that, the, you know, her own peace of mind legacy part in this question, um, there's also a way in which it, it does something for the ways that uh, the Black social body is viewed. And Snorton kind of comes at it with, a, with a, I think, a bit of a pessimistic uh, take on it, that it's like, Oh, now we now we know everything about Mariah. So that's you know the story is done, and we can we can do whatever we want with that. And how um, so? It's I th I think it's like another tension, right? That there's this way in which she really comes alive, and we get to access all this interiority. But then there's also like by bringing it into circulation, then um, you know how is it taken up and. Uh, what impacts can it have for the larger Black social body, I guess, is a question I have. <laughs> I mean, I guess I, I always think of autobiography as a performance. It's not transparent, right? You're always ordering, uh, as Harriet Jacobs would say, the incidents of your life. And you're so you're always leaving something out and you're always ordering them in a way to create a persona of some kind that does all kinds of things, right? Um, as I was reading this one, I mean, the persona, because there's so many personas, but I guess the overriding voice I heard was this retrospective Mariah, who's the diva, 
right, you know, thinking back on her childhood and how she got to this point of superstardom. So it's a really entertaining narrative sometimes because of all the darlings and, you know, you really hear her um, and you really feel Michaela on the other side, right, that they're having this conversation together. Um, so I don't know, I guess I always see autobiography as performative. Um, and it's always an ordering of a narrative for particular goals. Um, is it at, for a brand? Is it to reclaim her, uh, her story? Is it to tell um, her truth? Um, I mean, a lot of critics talk about the stories that are not there, right? Well, she didn't talk about Eminem. She didn't talk about whatever. Well, she said, I'm writing this, what the meaning of my life is to me, right? So clearly that's not meaningful. So. So I guess for me, it is always to think about um, the performance that's being made, the persona that's being constructed, and it's always doing some kind of work. Uh, this is too good to go, uh, to come to a hard stop at 7.30. So luckily we, we have a bit of leeway on the time and we can continue our conversation a little bit longer if audience members need to go. Uh, that's totally fine, but let me, turn to a series of a couple questions about um, money and family. Shane asks, Mariah writes about money quite a bit in her story. How do you think her money and success contributed to the ultimate fracture of her family relationships? It seems like a power dynamic she never wanted. And then Michael says, one of the most important things I took from the book is the levels of, of abuse Mariah has endured, especially in terms of the mental and emotional abuse at the hands of her ex-husband and family, which ultimately ended up being so detrimental to her mental health after so many years. Did the panel pick up on the importance of emotional abuse and mental health like I did? I, well, I, I guess I volunteer and speak, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know what to say uh, to that exactly, but I think we, I think that that's, and, and with regard to the thing earlier, I mean, this is a work of art that is, you know, that, that she's making as honest as she can make it, right? And I, I think it's very powerful and, and um, um, that, that abuse, that transparency about the things going on in the family, you, you feel the texture of that, you feel the reality of that, and I think one of the things you hang on to all through it is, is that, I mean, for the, the other side of it that maybe we don't focus on enough, but that love for her father, that is just palpable. It's so moving all through the, you know, the book. Um, um, I, think, I think some of those passages in the, you know, the, the sunflowers for Alfred, Alfred Roy things, those are, those, are, those are what will stick with me. It's an hour now. But it does will stick with me so much. So I mean, it seems to me that's just being real, you know. It doesn't stand out to me as um, I think that's part of the candor of the book. That's all, and and I, I'll leave it at that. A little, a little bit about the money, Michelle. It really was a shack. So let's just start. There. Like they were poor, poor. Okay. Like no money, poor. Like that shoes with holes. That's real. And and so when you go from that to one of the biggest record deals in history, because that Virgin deal at the time it was, and you're already working from a broken family. Money, money reveals who people are often. And it's a heartbreak to this day. And you all probably know and you know that ex brother has got a lawsuit. Like and we knew it was coming. And just just so you know, and, and I was forgive me for being a little defensive about that brand um, question because it was incredibly painful. There were there were memories that she experienced that she had buried and was recalling them for the first time through this process, particularly the story when the girls um, took her to um, Southampton and cornered her and called her the N-word. 
she she put that away. And there was another story with her ex sister um, when she was when she was burned with the tea. Like those were memories that came back as we were doing this, and it was incredibly difficult. She knew it was going to be lit it could be litigious. Tommy, anybody could have come for her, but she needed to excavate. She needed to. This is about freedom. This is this is about emancipation, and we called it the meaning of Mariah Carey. So yeah, so the M and M's and whatever, who don't mean much. We we got to have a, a lens. And um, so it, it, and thank you, Danny, for saying it's a work of art because she feels like this was her opus. Um, and it was, this was not a branding mechanism. How the publishing company uses it, how record people, like how brand, other brands, use it. I don't think of human beings as brands often, and that's that was my resistance. And I see her very much as a human being. Um, that how they use it, yeah, it's it's up to them. But um, the money, you know, mo, mo money, mo problems, is, that's very real. And it's very painful because her, she's, she's having to create her new family and put another family together. Um, Oh, and I'm so glad you uh, that you said that about the the shoes because I remember thinking at some point um, feeling like no the shoes like the 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 um, the boot that would get wet like that is um, such a specific uh, detail that really that really resonates um, and also like the choice between uh, uh, she said her her bagel or or the bus or the um, public transportation. And so I think what you when you say that it's like um, my chat my like questioning of, of the shack, I think there's two things there. I think there's like this kind of uh, label or name that she's using and and I think it can kind of follow in the line of the humor that she has, but that there's there's a reason why that humor is there and, and there's that truth that's that it's getting at. Um, and I think as far as like um, talking about emotional abuse and mental health, this book gives us an intersectional take on that. So the weathering that um, both Black folks and women and together, a, specifically a Black woman, is experiencing. Um, and I wanted to pull out from page 263, like this, ah, oh, I was like, yes, I felt so armored by by this um, the sentence where she said, um, my, my face was vulnerable and hadn't had any protection in many days. And I feel like I already knew what she was talking about, but the next sentence, she says, that's one function of makeup. Even while giving a natural look, it can serve as war paint, an invisible force field. Um, and I love it because it's uh, getting, again, at the, the femininity and the softness, but how she's using that to equip herself against the, the um, abuse and uh, um, mental trauma and physical trauma that she that she's um, endured. I think we can go for another 10 minutes if everybody's willing. And in that time, I'm hoping uh, that my colleague Karen Ferguson can re if you have reactions to any of these things that you've been holding in. Uh, it would be great to hear any of your reactions, Professor Ferguson. Why don't we prioritize that before we go to? Uh, I know I'm 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 uh, I'm very happy to um, uh, to yeah I, I I don't have anything to say. We have a question about religion then from our colleague Hilmar Pavel, the chair of the history department at SFU. The book begins and ends with biblical expressions of faith with the epigraph from Hebrews 11.1 1, and ends with the faith that makes all things possible, Matthew 17.20. Can we say that religious faith is central to Mariah Carey's freedom story? Is her freedom story only a political one? Um, I'll jump in. I often faith is central. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you go. Faith is, faith is, this is a story of survival and faith. And that, I mean, that's how we were, that's how we talked about it internally. Um, identity, um, survival, and faith. And while she does kind of 
practice in the, you know, in a in a Christian tradition, and she gives a lot of um, love and and she reveres her bishop. He was like a father figure. Um, that is that's the reason why she survived, basically. It's so interesting that you t that you brought up the, um, those two scriptures because she 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 just um, gave a speech. She's getting this innovator award, and she began the speech with Hebrews. Uh, uh, and she ended it with Matthew. Like she literally, the, those same scriptures that you brought up was how she um, was put together a speech yesterday. So faith is um, faith is the cord, the thread, the anchor in her um, in her life. Right. Um, I was gonna say I often think of the two of them as connected. Um, when I was talking about Black memoir as a freedom story, I, I said that often before you get to physical freedom, there's a, a psychological and emotional and a spiritual freedom that happens. I mean, if we just go back to Fred Douglas and his narrative, um, and he's fighting against Covey, like he was like, um, that was when he was no longer a slave, when he was able to have this psychological victory over Covey. He was still enslaved. He was still physically enslaved. But at that point, he was like, I'm, I'm completely a man. So um, I see those two levels happening in Mariah's book as well. You know, back to what Michaela says, I, I do remember in the book, she was saying it was finding her faith and going back to church. I forget the name of the church that allowed her to actually, you know, break free in other ways. So I, I think I think there's a duality there and, and they work together. I don't think they're necessarily separate. Um, the political part for me was like, well, just what does, it's kind of back to the question Michelle asked, um, how does this personal story play for a larger community, right? Um, and I think, I think there's, it, it's a model for those who read it, right, in terms of learning how they, two can get free, right, by being authentic about their inner stories, but what that, what kind of reverberations that can have in society, that part is political, if that makes sense, I hope. And maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but I would definitely say at the, at the conclusion of the book, I personally feel like restored in a faith of dreams, which is like, why I love fantasy and all of, I mean, just there's so much power in, in dreams and um, as well, you know, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, without a vision, the people perish, right? That's, that's, uh, that's that this music is so spiritual and, and American music is so rooted in the church one way or another, whether it's the Pentecostal movement at the turn of the 20th century or, or whatever, but the, the, you know, the, those things are so tied together and, 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 they're, and the way they're braided throughout this book is, 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 is natural and really gets the core of it. And, um, and I too, Michaela, just for what it's worth, <laughs> we have this tendency to talk about everything in terms of capitalist marketing, branding, you know, and when you're talking about an artistic vision, we call it a brand, which reduces it to something that it's not. It's much more than that. It's like why we get up in the morning and why we struggle and why we, you know, strive. And, you know. So, Jeremy, do we have one last question? We have a question from Frank that one motif that runs throughout the book is hair, black hair whether that is managing for it, caring for it, or finding freedom in it. I wonder what the panelists make of this motif and how it spoke to other themes and ideas brought forward in the book, especially in the context of history. I'm having problems sitting with silence, so. <laughs> I was trying to let y'all just go with it because you know i'm i use hair is actually organ is a philosophical 
powerful organizing principle that I use to talk about Black women's identity. And I've been sitting here going like, I'm not going to talk about Michelle's baby hairs because we're not talking about that today. We're talking about this book. But I've been, I was, you know, I was distracted because your edges look fantastic, Michelle. But yes, hair is important because Black hair is a, like I said, it's one of the, um, I think about it in the way that Eve Ensler used the vagina to talk about violence against women in the vagina monologues. Hair to me is a way to talk about the identity of black women and using hair as a metaphor. Um, and so, and what was so interesting about Mariah, when you, have, when you are a mixed race black person and your mother is white, very different experience and her not having someone understand her hair what has such significance because she instinctively knows what that means and then the world is going to have a reaction to it and I love this scene where her her very cool black auntie couldn't press it didn't know how they didn't know how to deal with it right they burned her hair that scene was so fun to write because again I'm obsessed with hair it's my whole philosophical foundation but um but then, uh, then her white mother didn't know how to do her hair, so no one knew how to do her, and that was such a that was such a um, significant thing. Or, or one one group saying her lips were too thin, and the other group saying her lips were too big. That what that's the central tension with her. And so, once she figured out her hair, and the whole her going to beauty school, that's a whole other book. Like it, some of those stories are so hysterical, we just couldn't put them in, but. Her going to beauty school is part of that finding herself um, through the texture of her hair. And any black woman, they have stories in their hair. So we had to, um, of course, make that. And actually, I had to restrain myself to make it, to not talk about it too much. But um, I am. Thank you so much for whoever asked that question to close out with hair, because now now we're complete. I feel I feel complete in this moment. Thank you. <laughs> Are we all complete? Does anybody else want to uh, talk about this? Okay. I'm, okay. I'm just so glad she talked about it because that's such an important thing in the book. Yeah. It, it, and I think it comes through. So that one scene where she's just like talking about her mother, just not being, uh, it's just, it's very, it, it really does. Uh, you make it real for, for even those of us who have not experienced that. I think it really, that, that lack of care by your mother um, and, or her lack of ability to actually even care for her um, it, or um, to know how to do it is really, um, is a really poignant uh, and, uh, and telling uh, scene in the book. I remember that very vividly. Yeah. Well, thank you all of you very, very much tonight. This was wonderful. And um uh, I, yeah, I just appreciate it so much. Uh, and um, uh, I hope everyone has a, uh, has in the audience has gotten a new appreciation. For, the questions were fantastic, by the way, I was, I, I was, the audience questions were terrific. And I hope that you've come away uh, with an even deeper understanding and, um, and, and especially if you're a fan, uh, a, um, a love of Mariah Carey and, and uh, an appreciation of what, what she's achieved and, um, uh, and, and what she represents as well. So thank you very much, everyone. And I hope you have a great weekend. Um, hope you listen to a lot of Mariah Carey this weekend. And um, uh, yeah, thank you for joining us for SFU History Reads. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen and Jeremy. Oops, lost your name. Thank you. Th thank you, Angela. And th thanks, Angela.